Jesus, we do come to worship you this morning. Father, we ask that you would open our hearts. Father, take away any distraction. Keep us from worshiping you, learning from you. Father, I open our hearts to the message you have for us today. Father, speak through your word. Father, touch each and every one of us in this place. Father, lead us as we pray in the sweet name of Christ Jesus. Well, amen. It's good to have you here. You can have a seat. By the way, Joe Brenda, thank you. Joe, thank you for the text. They're watching at home. He's got a new grandbaby this week, and some other things are going on. So whether you're sitting in here or you're sitting at home and relaxing in your pajamas, it's good to have you here. Uh, t today, I was going to teach um, on, on another issue, and... Uh, I was going through it with the staff like we do on Wednesday, and, and Keenan sent me some information. And the, the more I studied on it, the more I prayed about it, the more I realized I've, I've left something out. Um, and, um, <laughs> you know, our, our culture is not only becoming less Christian, uh, it's, it's actually becoming what most people would call post Christian. Uh, why, why do you believe the gospel is actually true? Why, the question that the culture would ask today is, is why should anyone in a highly educated, scientific, and technologically advanced culture accept Christianity? When, when asked, 23% of American adults claim that they're nuns. You know, not a N-U-N, not a nuns, a... Uh, N-O-N-E, a, a nun. Are you a Baptist, Methodist, Episcopalian, Catholic, um, atheist, agnostic? Or are you nothing? 23% say, I'm, I'm nothing, I'm, I'm a nun. 50% uh, of nuns with, come with, with religious backgrounds. In other words, they, they grew up in church. Uh, if you would do a study of of Baptist churches and, and Baptist youth ministries, you'll find that the majority of youth, when they graduate from high school, after they've attended all of our Wednesday night rallies and functions, actually never go to church again. That ought to bother us. 72% of nuns are between the, eight, between the age of 18 and 49. 57% of them are men. Two out of five adults in America today consider themselves post-Christians. At least three out of four youth leave the church after high school and never come back. Half of American skeptics actually have a college degree. The Christian birth rate is, is 1.3 times that of the nuns. In other words, as Christians, we have more kids 
than people that are not Christians. So if the majority of our children never go back to church, that means we're actually breeding church out of American culture, the church is. Why the rise? Science and faith are incompatible. Um, it, it's, it's irrational. There, there's no good reason to believe in God. Christianity is bigoted, intolerant, and needlessly exclusive. George Bonner Research Group said, our, our research suggests that most of the efforts of Christian ministries fail to reach much beyond the core of Christianized America. It's much easier to work with the already sympathetic than to focus on the so-called nuns. Christians for, for whom ministries about relationships may be disappointed when they find that many skeptics are not in, enamored of relational bonds as those who are already part of the church. In, a, in other words, we're trying to build relationships to reach them and they could care less about relationships. They, they don't want that. The state of modern theology is sadly the church is often ill-equipped The question is why? This is the problem that I have. 68% of people in churches today agree that God accepts the worship of all religions. Uh, one, of our, one of our attenders sent me a TikTok. I'm not a Twitter or a TikToker. Maybe I need to be a TikToker. When he said, go to TikTok, I thought we were going to play home game tic-tac-toe or something like that. Or, excuse me, online. But, but no, it was a... It was a video of a Satanist talking about how well he gets along with most Christians because they have a common belief system. And I'm going, I mean, my phone wouldn't lie, right? I mean, the Internet's not going to tell an untruth, right? But no, he was talking about how well he gets along with, he called them progressive Christians. how much they agree on the concepts of life. Well, Barna states that 68% agree that God accepts the worship of all religions. Satanism is a religion. 41% of people in American churches today agree that gender is simply a matter of choice. I had a hard time saying that. Um, Forty-nine percent agree that religion is a matter of personal opinion rather than objective truth. Where I got this was from Southeast or Southern Evangelical Seminary. It actually Keenan put me onto the site. Dr. Richard Howe said that good theology is essential to good discipleship. You see, see what's happened is that, is, that, is that we've played church and we've had so much fun in church. We, 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 we've made it so easy that, 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 that we don't instill good theology. You know, I was... As I'm thinking about teaching the preschoolers today, it's, it's hard for me to have my mind in two places because I know in an hour I'm fixing to be with in, in, for an hour, and and uh, and, and I, I think about the difference in our in our worship songs today. Hey, there's nothing wrong with praise and worship of today. I, I think it's great. It, it's it's good. It's fun. You can move to it. But I, I think about some of those hymns of on, oh, on Christ the solid rock I stand. It, it, where, where it talks about the theology of Jesus Christ being the foundation stone of our lives. And I'm going, where are the songwriters today when it comes to teaching the depth of theology?
the question that, that I want to answer today is, is how do I engage a culture that's woke or a culture that wants to cancel things? I'll give you, I'll give you two examples. A few months back, my, my wife made a comment about a post on Facebook. And, and it was about taxes, and, and it was around April, and we were talking about the taxes that we were having to pay, and she was looking, and, and she said, you mean we actually, we actually pay 10% of our gross in property taxes, and over 14% in, 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 in Social Security, because I'm self-employed, I have to pay 14% of the gross on that. She said, over 25% before you see anything, I said, yeah. She said, well, that's, that's not fair. And somebody had said something about taxes and, you know, that taxes were unfair and, and some people do pay taxes and some people don't. And Shelly simply says, you know, I'm tired of paying 25% and I'm just going, if it was just 25%, that'd make it much easier. And so she put a post, 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 post on, she commented in somebody's post and one of the students in our church said, well, Miss Shelley, I never thought that, that I would believe that you were a, a racist and a bigot. And, and I mean, being a husband, I'm thinking, I'm, I'm fixing, my wife? Um, so anyway, I prayed a day before, a day before I realized how I was going to respond and, and, uh, Once. Second, I, I'm in the in sitting down with a group of guys, and they started talking about riots and that were going on, and 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 I asked a question, and and the because because I really wanted to know, I, I wanted to know why there aren't riots in Chicago, and the guy said, well, well, why would there be riots in Chicago? This didn't happen in Chicago. I said, well, well, no. What I mean is, is that there are twice as many black men killed every year in Chicago as black men killed by police in the entire United States. Matter of fact, there are more black men killed in Chicago every year than by police killing both white and black people in front of the entire nation. Why aren't we rioting in Chicago? And he looked at me and he said, figures that a white racist would say something like that. Anyway, some of the guys that know me kind of laughed and said, you don't know who you're talking to. He says, yeah, I'm talking to a fat white guy who doesn't understand the plight of the brothers. And they just kind of laughed. You see, you see part, of the, part of the problem is that one of the primary characteristics of our current culture of wokeness and cancellation is a bent toward ad hominem. Um, ad hominem is an attack directed against the person rather than the position they're maintaining, such as a vicious ad, ad hominem attack. It's, it's, it's a Latin term, it's an adverb. It, it is in a way that is directed against a person rather than the position they're maintaining. Those these points come from some of our best information sources who realize they're being attacked ad hominem. Instead of talking about the idea or the concept, we, we begin to label. We use such words as racist, bigot, radical, uh, stormtrooper. Uh, the, the New York Times, after a political debate, uh, labeled every Republican senator and representative and simply made a caricature of rats and put their names in the middle of them. There, there's not a debate or discussion about the issue. There's simply a character trait assassination about an individual. You see, when, when you and I engage this culture, we, we, we can't do that. There's, there's not a debate or discussion about ideas. There's a debate or discussion about people. There's a debate about integrity. There's not a debate about issues. There's, there's not even a discussion of issues. But you and I as Christians must come to a place where we realize that, 
that as I told you last week, whenever you stand for Christ, Jesus said you are going to face tribulation, you're, you're going to face slurs, you're, you're going to face personal attack. So what must you and I do to engage this woke or this canceled culture? One of the things we need to make sure is that we're informed. We need to speak the truth about with ideas without ad hominem. If you think about every time Jesus interacted with people, there is only one time, and I'm going to make this up, he was ad hominemistic. There's only one time that he looked at an individual and shared with them a caricature instead of a thought or an idea. And that was to the Pharisees. He looked at them and said, you're whitewashed sepulchers, you're hypocrites. The only time he did that. To the woman at the well, he engaged not in character assassination, and he could have assassinated her character but he chose to speak of ideas and truths. To the woman who was caught in adultery, he could have been ad hoministic, but he engaged in ideas. Paul issues this challenge in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. In other words, Paul is saying you and I don't need to be ad hoministic toward people. I've learned a new word this week and I want to use it, okay? I'm trying to teach it to you. I am, I'm smart as Kenan. I'm teaching you Latin this week, okay? Kenan, listen to the tape about them. You, you'll get it, okay? I'm not, I'm not, I'm not down to you, okay? Uh, Paul said, even though we live in the world, we don't wage war like the world does. We don't assassinate character. We don't call people names. What do we do? Verse 4, the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. I realize I skipped. I'm going to go back to one in just a moment. Notice, notice what Paul is, 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 is trying to help them understand. He's, he's trying to help them understand that there is a power in the Word of God. That... that as you and I speak and share the Word of God, there is power in it. Notice he said they have divine power to demolish strongholds. That the teachings of Scripture break down strongholds with ideas that demolish arguments in every pretension that sets itself against the knowledge of God. There are things that are going on in our culture that sets itself against the knowledge of God. And what do we do to interact that? We teach Scripture. So what do we need to do? Verse 25. Of Ephesians chapter 4 therefore each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor for we are all members of one body our ideas must be generated from Scripture what does the Bible say and that's what we need to teach that's where the authority is. The authority is not in our opinion. The, the idea is not that we can trash somebody to make them look bad. That there would be a discussion about truth and about ideas. You can disagree with me. That's fine. 
But let's talk about what's really going on and how this really engages the culture. How the Bible should direct our paths and our ideas. Now, now I, I agree that at times when you and I sit in front of someone and say, well, the Bible says, they're going to go, well, I don't agree with the Bible. And that's, that, but that's, that's when we need to speak truth based on Scripture. Do you believe that it's a good thing for a man to cheat on his wife? The answer's, come on, help me out here, help me out. No, okay, great. What does the Bible say about that? The Bible says a man shouldn't cheat on his wife. You've already got somebody agreeing with the Bible already. What you've done is you're talking about an idea. There are ideas that shape our life, that shape our existence. All I'm saying is that we need to be students of God's Word so it informs our ideas so that when we speak truth into a culture that is woke or a culture that wants to cancel, we try to help them understand biblical truth without citing Scripture. Going back to the discussion, discussion I had yesterday, God says, well, well, Carl, why would you say that? Do you have a problem with Black Lives Matter? And I'm going, I don't have a problem with the idea that Black Lives Matter. I believe that Black Lives Matter. I, I believe that, that the black people in Chicago that are murdered by the hundreds every year matter. I think we should be just as mad about that as we are about the man that was killed by a police officer. Yeah, but don't you think they're different? I said, you know, each person's family lost somebody they love, right? How's that different to that family? Can that family raise them from the dead? I believe that I should love everyone. I believe that God loves everyone. See how you, you, you if, if you can talk about the idea, you can begin to shape it and bring it around to a biblical narrative. But as long as it's, well, I think, well, I think, and, and, and there's ad hominem, there's labels, there's innuendos, there's accusations, there's never going to be discussions. But for you and I to speak about ideas, we must make sure that our ideas are formed through Scripture. Why? Because I believe with all my heart that the Scripture has the potential to convict and change lives. My opinion is not going to change a life. I can tell somebody what I think, but the scriptures teach us, teach us that it is the Bible that has the ability to convict and change lives. Notice verse 22. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off the old self, which being corrupted by its deceitful de desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put off on a new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Notice it says created. When you and I begin to study God's word and we internalize it, let the words of my of mouth and the meditations of my heart be wholly acceptable to you, God. When you and I begin to study God's word, it begins to reshape our thought processes. It changes us into a new person. It is God's word that convicts. And I realize as the world looks at Christians now, in our culture, the majority say, I don't believe the Bible is true. 
as I shared with you last week, they're, they're actually pastors and teachers that are standing in front of people saying, well, really, God wasn't telling the truth there. God was lying. There's no power in that. But Paul says when you and I begin to study God's word, it turns us into a new person. We're transformed and reshaped through the word of God. That's why the psalmist said, Thy word have I hid in my heart that, what? that I might not sin against God. The book of John chapter 8, to the Jews who believed them, Jesus said, if you hold to my teachings, you're really my disciples, then you will know the truth and the truth will do what? The truth will set you free. How do you and I remove addiction from our life? Studying God's word. How do you and I, instead of saying, I think I can, I wish I can, I want to, but I just can't. We get into God's word. Every day begin to study God's word. It is God's word that changes lives. And I know you're going, but Carl, you just told us you can't speak to them about the Bible says. I, I don't, it's not what I'm saying. When, when you and I begin to talk about concepts in our culture that are based on the teachings of God's word, God's word will, will not return void. As a, as, a, as a teacher of the gospel, as a preacher of the gospel, the only thing that I can stand on is the Bible. If the Bible can't change lives, do you actually think you and I can? I'm not talking about getting the big old black Bible if they don't listen to you, whack them over the side of the head. What I'm saying is you and I need to immerse and bathe our minds and our thoughts so much into God's Word that our thoughts are permeated and saturated with the Word of God. The only thing I can think of is when the pipes burst in, in the nursery area and this four-inch main busted and it squirted all over everything. There's a bunch of insulation up there. We had paper insulation. And so what does is, what is paper chips do with water? It soaks it up. And then the paper chips were on top of of gypsum board, okay, sheetrock. What does sheetrock do with water? It sucked it up. So you've got a foot of insulation sucking up water, half or three quarter inch chipboard, gypsum board soaking up water. And so the water made the paper heavy. The heavier it got, the more it began to sag and sink and it began to sot down. Y'all know what sot down is, don't you? Sot down is when you, I sot down on the chair. Okay, you hadn't been through Mississippi enough, okay? So the insulation shot sot down on the sheetrock, and the sheetrock sot down on the suspended, the drop ceiling that's made of uh, wood or uh, paper fiber board, and the water hit it, and it did what? It, it soaked it up, so it all got so heavy it did what? It fell to the flow. To the flow. Okay, okay. So once we got in there, the room simply was saturated and everything that was up there was down here saturated with water. So when you begin to pick up sheetrock, it just kind of clumped in your hand. So we just got shovels and just popped it down. Then we put it in bags. And we had a hard time carrying the bags outside. Why? Because the bags were filled mostly with water held by paper. And we put the rag, and finally I just started dragging them. When you drag a plastic bag over concrete, what happens? 
it tears. So now for a week, the plastic bags are sitting outside. I'm getting to a point, I promise you. The plastic bags filled with paper, cellulose insulation, sheetrock, and fiber stuff, okay? Fill with water, and for a week, what did those bags do out of the holes in the bottom where I drug it on the concrete? They just leaked water. Why? Because they were saturated. In, in Ephesians chapter 4 and 2 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul is talking about how as a believer that you and I so saturate our lives with the Word of God that no matter what we do, it just begins to seep out. What happens when you and I are informed by the Word of God and we, and we do as Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians 10, which I read earlier, where the Word of God can begin to demolish strongholds, we realize that it is the power of the Spirit of God that begins to change people as the Word of God begins to seep through our lives. As we're sitting around and a guy still says, well, I'm, I'm just a fat white racist. He said, where are you from? I said, I'm from Louisiana. He said, well, you're probably part of the clan. And anyway, one of my friends, his name's Jerome, kind of laughed and said, man, you don't know this guy. Yeah, I do. He's one of them that stands against us and said, I don't think you understand. He said, his, his son-in-law is black. He looked at me and he said, is your son-in-law black? And I said, no. Jerome said, yeah, yeah, he is. He's black. I said, no, he's not. My son-in-law is a man of God that works two jobs to provide for his family. Well, well isn't he black? I don't know. I really don't care. He's a man that loves God, and he works two jobs to provide for his family. Now, leave my son out of this. Let's talk about what's really going on. Carl, come on. I've met Mike. You see, I've been taught by the Word of God that, that there's neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free. That we're all one in Christ. There's no black or white or brown or yellow. There's either believers or people that God wants to be believers. We don't look at the world the way other people do. And when we begin to teach people what the Scripture teaches, folks, I want to tell you, that's the world that I want to live in. I want to live in a world that does not look at a man by the color of his skin, but by the character of his heart and the thoughts of his mind. And it's not going to get that way by calling people names. But by speaking the truth in love. Racism is not changed any other way than by changing the character of the heart that informs the mind to look at life differently. And that only happens through the teaching of God's word and the transforming power of the Spirit of God. So when you and I interact with the woke culture, you need to be informed and empowered. And you need to be ready. There's a story in the book of Esther about a culture that was in turmoil, kind of like ours. There was a racial war going on in the day of Esther. Esther was one of the king's wives. 
This was back in the day when kings could have official num wives numerously. And, and uh, Esther was beautiful, beautiful Jewish girl. She had married the king, and the king had put out an edict that, that every Jew in the kingdom needed to be killed. So Mordecai comes to Esther and says, Esther, you've, 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 you've got to do something. Esther, you've got to go to the king and, and you've got to get him to change this ruling because if you don't, we're all going to be killed. But the rule was is that the only time even a wife could approach the king is when the king asked for his wife. Now that's an unusual rule. In other words, she couldn't go see... If she went to the king by her own volition, the king could say, cut off her head and... She'd be dead. <clears throat> Esther understood this. So in verse 10 of Esther chapter 4, <clears throat> she instructed him to say to Mordecai, all the king's officials and the people of the royal providences know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law that he may put to death unless the king extends the gold scepter to them, spares their lives, but 30 days has passed since he called me to go before him. She said, listen, Listen, Uncle Mordecai, I don't think you understand. He hadn't asked to talk to me for 30 days. And you want me to get in the middle of the most intense political debate in the history of our nation without his consent, without his desire. He didn't want to talk to me about this. He just said every Jew needs to be killed. Uncle, if I do this, he can kill me. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are the king's house alone that all the Jews will escape. Folks, I want to tell you, as a follower of Jesus Christ, living in a culture that is a majority none, don't think if you just sit in your little house and you just keep your mouth shut and you stay quiet and you let the world just go destroy itself that it's not going to touch you i promise you it's coming mordecai said esther don't think if you ignore this that it's just going to blow away for if you remain silent at this time, the relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. Here's, here's one of the things that, 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 that I want you to understand for such a time as this. Whether you get involved by being informed and empowered or you stay silent I want you to listen to me hear me if you if you don't listen to anything else I say you need to listen to this God is going to do with America what God desires to do if he does it without you it's still going to be done If God really is God, who are you and I and our decision going to stop what God wants to do? It is going to happen. Revival or destruction is going to happen. The only question is are you going to be part of the solution? Are part of the problem. Now we'll read that verse one more time. If you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will rise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. And who knows, but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. I want to ask you a question. How do you not know that today, tomorrow, next week, Friday, Thursday, Tuesday evening, 
that God hasn't placed you at that specific place at that specific moment in time for such a time as that. God looked at me the other day and he said, Carl, how do you think we can stop what's going on? I said, the only way you can stop what's going on is there has to be a change of heart. When the heart's changed, the, the heart begins to transform, the heart transforms the mind, and the mind is transformed, the thoughts are transformed, and people will no longer look at people by the color of their skin. But it has to happen in here. But gentlemen, I want to tell you, the heart is not changed intellectually. The character of the heart is changed by God. You see, the Bible teaches me that everybody's blown it. Everybody's done things that are bad. Everybody's done things that are wrong. But it also teaches me that God loved me so much that he sent his son Jesus, and God killed him on the cross. And the reason he did that is to pay for the things that I've done wrong. So there come a day, October the 31st of 1982, that I prayed and asked Jesus to forgive me the things that I've done wrong. And God changed my heart. The teachings of Scripture began to change my mind. So that 25 years later, when my beautiful only daughter walked down the aisle of this church and I grabbed her hand and I gave her away to a man of God, what I was proud of that he loved God. If you want to change your mind, change your heart and study God's word and it'll change your mind. I pray that as a believer, we will not argue the way the world is arguing now ad hoministically that we would never attack a person but I pray that you will have the courage to attack ideas as the band comes to lead us in worship as we close let's stand and pray Father God I thank you for your love and your grace I thank you, Father, for the day you've given us. God, I, I pray with all of my heart. Your Father, if there are people here that have never come to the place where they've asked Jesus Christ to change their lives, Father, I pray today you'd help them understand that God can transform them so much with a tenderness and a passion that'll reshape and challenge their life. Father, I pray that today would be the day that they would say, yes, today I choose to trust Jesus. Father, the potential and the power, the shaped lives, the blessings, the things that you will do for them is unimaginable. God, today I pray that today is that moment in time. Father, there's some believers here today, people that call themselves Christians that need to spend more time in your word more time in prayer so that they can be informed and empowered when they engage the culture. Father, I pray that you would forgive us every time we desire to attack a person instead of an idea. Father, I thank you that your word is powerful, that your word attacks ideas, that your word changes ideas that your words 
your teachings, your scripture, transform lives through the power of your spirit. Father, I pray we'd commit to be informed and empowered today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you need somebody to talk to and pray with, I'll be standing in the back as the band leads us in our closing song.